Well, this morning I have the privilege to share God's word with you, and I'm so grateful to open up the word of God. My name is Nathan Payne. I have the privilege to serve here as the location pastor here at uh, Near North and to oversee our center region. And I'm grateful that those of you who are watching online are with us. I'm also grateful to see many faces in the house today as our first time gathering for this year. Grateful for you and good to be with you this morning. We're going to be in the book of Romans as we continue our series at the Apostle Paul as he's written to the church in Rome in the first century. We'll be in Romans chapter 15 verses 20 2 to 33, so you can go ahead and navigate there on your device or get a Bible with you. But before we jump into that, I have some kids in the room and I have some kids in your room. I'm probably talking to you right in your living room as you're listening with your mom and your dad. So I want you to gather around really quick because I just want to talk to you for a second. So kids, I want to ask you this question. What gets you really excited? I mean, really, really motivated. Is it ice cream? Is it playing with your friends? Is it math homework? Uh, Maybe Legos. Uh, But can I tell you something that used to get me super excited when I was a kid? Saturday mornings. I mean, you see, Saturday mornings was, was the main day. Uh, well, really, it was the only day when you could watch cartoons all morning on TV. Now, you have to understand, I'm a little bit older than you, so we didn't have Netflix, we didn't have streaming, we didn't have Hulu, and we couldn't afford cable. So I'd get up super early on Saturday. I'd never like to get up early, but on Saturday, I'd get up super early. I'd fix myself a bowl of sugary cereal. I mean, like, I would put... Sugar on frosted flakes, that kind of a thing. We got some old people in here who know what I'm talking about. I plop on the couch in front of the TV and I start watching my shows like Scooby-Doo, Transformers, and a few others. See, because I was so excited, it moved me out of my bed to get going on Saturday mornings. And this morning, we're going to talk about a man named Paul who was excited and moved by the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. It moved him to tell people about Jesus who'd never heard of him. The the gospel moved him to care for people suffering under poverty, and the gospel moved him to love the church, God's people. His excitement, his motivation was so deep that he gave up things that he wanted. He sacrificed, he endured hardship and difficulty because he was moved by that. So kids, this morning, I want you to hear me, that what excites you It moves you. It moves you. All right. To the rest of the adults that are in the room and young folks that are watching, the one thing I want you to remember out of today's message is that gospel ambition moves you until there's no place left. I'll say that again. Gospel ambition moves you until there's no place left. We're going to jump behind the scenes of Paul's life uh, and the theology that he shared in Romans and look at how this man has been living out his life. And if we kind of get this behind the scenes look of what's going on in Paul's life and mind and heart right now, we'd almost see that Paul feels like he's just getting started. And maybe today some of you are too. Let's read our passage out of Romans 15, 22 to 33. It says, This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on by my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they also ought to also be of servants to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. 
I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Let's pray before we jump in God's word. Lord, we welcome you into this space, this moment, O oh God. We welcome you, O oh God, because this is your word. This is your people. And God, we invite you to speak. We invite you to shape us, to, to take the word, your word and cut deep and, sh- and, and then shape us in a way that we'd be more like Jesus and following him in our resolve to make him known. God, we invite you to change us, encourage us, challenge us, minister to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to be in this passage in Romans 15, and I want us to just see here that what we're seeing in this passage is that Paul is coming to the end of this letter that he's been sharing to this people, this church in Rome, and he wants to share with them his future plans. And it's pretty fitting that that on a month in the first part of the year here in January, that as we look ahead to 2021, that this passage comes into view as we think about to the next year, as we think about the next three years, the next 10 years for us as a church and where God might be taking us. I mean, last week, Pastor Trevor taught on how Paul saw his life as something to be spent for the sake of the gospel. And this week, Paul continues that train of thought. I mean, to get the context, we can look at verse 19 where Paul says this from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And up to this point, what Paul has done, and he's gone on three missionary journeys that have taken him around the Roman world. I mean, he's been driven by this desire to make Christ known among the Gentiles and set his mind on a strategy to plant churches in all the major cities or in major places around the Roman world. It's estimated by scholars that Paul had traveled nearly 10,000 miles, mostly on foot, as he traversed what's called Asia Minor in the Grecian area. area. I mean, it's literally, it's like walking from L.A. to New York on foot four times. A little bit more than a red-eye trip. His trips took him across modern-day Israel, Syria, Turkey, and Greece, and he endured persecution. He endured hardship, hunger, tragedy, beatings, plots to kill him, pain, imprisonment, all for the sake of that mission. Whatever you think about Paul, one thing we can all agree on is that he had something that moved him, something inside of him that pressed him to go into those places, and he had what I would like to call a gospel ambition. My question for you this morning, whether you're sitting here under the sound of my voice or whether you're watching this on a screen, is what moves you. What moves you? Look at verse 22. It says, this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. Uh, This reason, this reason that Paul is talking about should cause us to look back and ask, what is the this that's hindered him from coming to see the people in Rome that he longs to see? He gives us a further explanation if we look at verse 20 and 21. Paul says, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Paul says, my ambition is to preach the gospel to people 
in places that have not yet heard the good news of Jesus Christ. It means he's been working, continuing to travel the Roman world, pressing forward with planting churches and establishing new works where Jesus had not been proclaimed. And I believe that as followers of Jesus that we are all meant to have a gospel ambition that interrupts and disrupts and shapes and determines our course of life. Let's look a little bit closer. Paul says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named. Where Christ has not been named. His ambition compels him with a love for the unreached peoples of the world. And I think if Paul was alive today in January of 2021 in our globalized, digitally connected, culturally and ethnically polarized age, he would be enthralled with the global mission of the church. He would be dumbfounded, probably perplexed and yet thrilled at the opportunity that there still today remains so many places in the world where the gospel isn't being proclaimed. He'd stagger at the reality that there are nearly 7,000 people groups with particular languages and customs on planet Earth who have nearly no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We use the term unreached to say that there is, this is a, an indigenous community of believing that there are no indigenous communities of believing Christians with an adequate number and resource to evangelize that people group without outside assistance. That's what we mean by unreached people. And at present day, in all of our world's globalized, digitalized connectivity, these 7,000 people groups represent 3.2 billion people who have little or no access to the gospel. The population of Christians of less than 5% and probably much lower than that. If I could explain it using the analogy uh, of available healthcare access in our context of the pandemic. In the city of Chicago, we have a population of 2.7, 2.8 million people. We have a number of hospitals all over the city, over the region, and those hospitals have a particular number of beds. I think the last number when I looked at the Chicago, uh, the city of Chicago data, data we had about 8,800 hospital beds. Now, I want you to imagine, if you can, in the context of a pandemic, that there was only one single hospital in all of the city of Chicago to treat 2.8 million people. Imagine that there's no Northwestern Memorial. There's no University of Chicago. There's no Rush. There's no UIC. There's no Cook County. There's no Swedish Covenant. No Illinois, Illinois Masonic. Just one single hospital. It gets even more dramatic when we look at the reality of unreached people groups in the world today, that out of that group, nearly 2 billion of those people have less than 0.1% of a population who are followers of Jesus. 0.1%. In other words, they have virtually no opportunity to respond to the good news of Jesus. If we were going to continue that hospital analogy, I want you to imagine in the city of Chicago if there were no hospitals at all, but not just no hospitals. At imagine there was only one doctor for the entire population of the city of Chicago. That would be insane, and yet that is a reality for some of the people groups on this planet as we sit here in our comfort, in our chairs, in our living rooms, listening to this message. Reminds me of a story of one of our members, Christian, who was on a global trip in a remote village in Indonesia just not long ago, where he met and walked alongside an elderly woman who was blind, who'd grown up in that particular village as he walked 
beside her, hand in hand, not being able really to communicate with her because no one was there to speak her language. The reality just struck him and should strike us that he couldn't share the joy, the freedom, the peace, the presence, the forgiveness, the hope that is found in Jesus because there was no one who could speak her language. That's an unreached people group. And I say that's why you should consider taking the perspectives course, which starts this Thursday online, by the way. You will not see the world the same way. Paul says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named. And this was a future-orienting ambition that Paul had to ensure that his life was spent seeing the gospel cross boundaries and go to the hardest places in the world. Look what Paul says in verse 22. It was this same gospel ambition that hindered him. It didn't just drive him to go other places. It also kept him from experiencing some things too. Experiencing things that he longed to do. He's saying this. He's saying, for many years there were places I often wanted to be and there were people I often wanted to see but I did not because of my ambition to make Christ known. Paul understood what it was like to really want to do something, to be something, to commit to something to the point that it kept him from doing other things that he also really wanted to do. His gospel ambition moved him but it also kept him. I mean, look what Paul says in the opening of Romans chapter 1 when he's talking about this longing. Uh, I mean, he says this in verse 11, for I long to see you. Look further down. I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Paul has a longing to be with the churches in Rome, and yet he can't. What these opening verses remind us is that God's calling on our lives is not always going to align with our desires. God's calling on your life may not always align with all of your desires. It meant that Paul's plans were disrupted, his desires and some of his longings were unfulfilled. Sometimes what we want, sometimes what we miss, sometimes what we long for, sometimes has to wait, maybe indefinitely. And I'm compelled as your pastor, as your brother in Christ, to ask you these questions and to ask myself these questions. What do you long for that you refuse yourself due to God's calling on your life? What do you long for that you refuse yourself due to God's calling on your life? Whatever that is for you, remember that it is through commitment and sacrifice and obedience that we find God's path of purpose for our lives and it's on that path that God speaks to us words of joy and peace like nowhere else where we find that he is our great satisfaction often God is working through our perseverance and our devotion to him amidst our longing while we are waiting to bring about eternal significance. Brings to mind so many of your stories. I think of Kay, I'm not saying her full name out of privacy for her, but she's a dear sister who's part of our church family. She's a faithful servant. She's battled a chronic illness where she suffered from pain, fatigue, and a seemingly endless amount of therapies to find relief. A number of us have prayed alongside her that she would be healed, and yet in the midst of all the waiting, she's been one of the most faithful prayer warriors that our church has. She's prayed for me. She's prayed for you. 
She's compassionately reached out to her, uh, her and serve her elderly neighbors all while the pandemic was raging. And she has this, uh, I call it an ebullient joy that you just can't help but be impacted by and all in the waiting and in the longing. Well, I think what's tricky about preaching a passage like this is most of us don't actually see our calling to be Paul's. And most of the commentaries, if you look and read, uh, they'll make the same point like, don't worry, not all of us are Paul's. And let me be honest, most sermons will say, hey, we're not really, most of us aren't Paul's. So he's just kind of otherworldly. It's like, he's like Michael Jordan, like be like Mike, yeah, right. Which Jordan is the goat, by the way. I mean, this guy, Paul, he's engaged in cross-cultural ministry. He's a pioneer missionary. He's always breaking new ground in the gospel. He dreams about these places. He keeps them up at night. He has just this driving ambition. And you get the sense from reading the passage that there's a relentlessness to Paul's story, almost an audaciousness and adventurous spirit that seems just indomitable and, and frankly incompatible with the monotony of the lives that we live at times. We're just trying to live our life. We're trying to do our job. We're trying to save some money, maybe buy a condo or buy a house, save some more money, maybe find someone special to spend my life with, or maybe I want to get, I'm just, I'm just trying to get married, you know? Maybe I'm just trying to have kids. I'm just trying to travel a little. I'm just trying to pay off my college loans. I'm just trying to figure out the e-learning thing right now. Paul, please, I'm just trying to save money for retirement. I'm trying to retire. Uh, I'm trying to travel a little bit more. Die. I mean, Paul's gospel ambition rubs up against us and causes us to ask ourselves, what is the fundamental thing that is motivating, that is moving our lives? What is our ambition? What moves us? Paul's gospel ambition carries him to plant enough churches in a particular region that he can say to the churches, hey, you guys got this. Uh, I haven't preached to every person or every village, uh, but now there's enough of a Christian presence here that you guys can pick up where I left off. And, And friends, this morning, for those of us who live in this city, who are part of this church, the task has been left to you. It's been left to us that our gospel ambition for this city is that every man, every woman, every teenager, every child has the opportunity to respond to the gospel. It falls on us to pray to that end, to share the good news of Jesus with the people God has placed in your corner of the world, your friends, your neighbors who live in the unit next to you, your coworker. That's why you should join us for prayer at noon throughout the week as we pray for the gospel to expand around the globe, for the gospel to expand in our communities and the lives of people that God has placed us. So we pray for the gospel to cause renewal and revival in our city. That's why some of you need to take up the invitation. Alpha starting, Alpha at home is starting on Tuesday night. Take up the invitation and invite someone. It's our responsibility why we as a region near North and Lincoln Park, our elders are praying, where, God, where, do you, where are you calling us next in this city? We all need a gospel ambition like Paul that compels us to go to every person in every place that God sends us until there is no place left. Look at verse 23. It says, I no longer have any room for work in these regions So now he can tell the church in Rome, hey, it's time, I'm coming to you. And he says to enjoy your company for a while in verse 24, but just for a while, just in passing, because I need your help before I make my way to Spain. Because in Spain, there are no followers of Jesus there. I'm going to the next place. I can see how it's kind of hard to relate to a guy like Paul. But first... Look at what Paul says in verse 25. 
At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. At present, however, means as in before I go to Rome and then go to Spain. First, I'm going to go to Jerusalem to bring aid to the saints. And even though Paul longs to be with the Christians in Rome and he hasn't seen them for years due to his gospel ambition to preach Christ where Christ hasn't been named, Paul is still willing to go first, literally 1,000 miles in the opposite direction to ensure safe delivery of provisions to the Christians living in poverty in Jerusalem. Park, I want you to hear me that Paul's heart for the unreached in Spain does not negate his heart and responsibility to love and care for the poor in Jerusalem. I will say this again. Paul's heart for the unreached in Spain does not negate his heart and responsibility to love and care for the poor in Jerusalem. We don't know all the circumstances of why they were poor, but what matters is that they were. And Paul, who's motivated and moved by a gospel ambition, is determined to bring them relief. He's going way out of his way, and and not just going out of his way, he's going somewhere that's gonna put him at great risk. Verse 30, when he says, we want to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. He's talking about when he'd been there before in Jerusalem that they wanted to kill him. If he shows up, what's going to happen to him? This is the Apostle Paul, the author of the book of Romans, one of the greatest theological treatises in the scripture. Paul, the theologian. Paul, the church planner. Paul, the defender of gospel fidelity and doxology. He doesn't indicate in the least that he's succumbing to a social gospel when he offers aid to the impoverished believers in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, it's implied that this is an outworking of the reconciling power of the gospel that had so radically changed his life and the lives of the people that he preached to. Paul didn't choose to just preach the gospel for him. Providing for these needs was the rightful expression of the reality of the power of the gospel itself. I think Paul's plans can easily overwhelm us, but I think they should, in fact, inspire us to a new way of living because they show us that the way of Jesus, of following Jesus, the Christian life is not reductionistic. See, Paul holds within himself a tension of all the passions of Jesus Christ. He carries within him a gospel ambition that compels him to see the unreached reached in Spain, compels him to encourage and continue preaching the gospel to the established church in Rome. It compels him that all, he would do all of this without neglecting to care for the poor in Jerusalem. He holds each of these places in tension. A demonstration of the holistic Christian life. 